It's always uh, great to have you with us, and we appreciate your taking the time. I know you're very busy getting ready for the Big, uh, Big 12 tournaments coming up, both women's and men. But uh, I'll turn it over to you to talk about WVU basketball history. Well, uh, it's extensive. Um, obviously, um, West Virginia basketball, everybody remembers the golden era um, with Jerry West and, and Rod Hundley and Rod Thorne. Uh, there was a time um, when West Virginia had a, street, a series of All-American players starting from Mark Workman in the early 1950s. And went all the way along up to Fritz Williams uh, in the in the mid '60s. So it's been a great run. I know when um, through the years there was a time, believe it or not, when people considered Mountaineer basketball on par with Kentucky uh, in terms of uh, prestige and relevance. And and you know when you think about West Virginia basketball, I, I, particularly during the years of Hunley and West and Thorne. You know, I, I compare it a lot to Gonzaga because uh, they were in a conference similar, uh, dominated a conference the same way that Gonzaga dominated their conference and then branched out uh, on a national level um, with, with uh, what West Virginia did. Because I think the Southern Conference was kind of in the shadows of the ACC, which had broken off from the Southern Conference in the early 50s. And West Virginia uh, managed to, uh, to uh, overcome uh, some of the competitive deal it, things that they had in the Southern Conference with the schedule that they played. I mean, they played a national schedule. They traveled everywhere. And West Virginia basketball in the 50s was was phenomenal and into the 60s. It was great, great history. Um, and um, uh, even, even before that, into the 40s, and I think one of the links to those two eras was probably Fred Schaus. Fred Schaus played for Lee Patton, learned a game from Lee Patton, and in the 50s um, had great teams and then used that to, to get a job with the Lakers when, when Jerry West went there. So great, great history um, for many, many years. And um, I know a lot of old timers, um, you, know, uh, you know, it's it's just been viewed with great fondness and uh, enjoy. Jerry West, I think, was the key. And, you know, Jerry West not only helped basketball recruiting, he helped football recruiting. A lot of the football recruits that that came to West Virginia knew about Jerry West. Um, and um, I think he was a, an important piece. Obviously, he was a state native. His name was on the front of the jersey and on the back of the jerseys. How many how many players do you know that can have that happen? And for him to to be able to represent WVU. But, but you know, um, the thing about Mountaineer basketball and – some of the guys that I talked to through the years, what made Mountaineer basketball so appealing and exciting was the style of play. And it, and it, and it emanated in the high school system. You had guys like Jerome Van Meter and um, D'Antoni and all these great coaches in West Virginia that was playing an up-tempo style of basketball. And I can remember uh, Chuck No, who coached at Virginia Tech, they always used to say, that had Chuck No not recruited Chris Smith, that West Virginia would have won the national championship in 1959 because Chris Smith was from Charleston. Uh, he was about 6'7". He was a tough inside player. And that's what the team lacked that year. Um, they had everything else. And I mentioned that to Fred Schaus one time, and Fred Schaus said, yeah, that's true. But had Chuck No gotten Jerry West, they would have won a national championship <laughs> at Virginia Tech. So, you know, but the thing was, is that Chuck No came to West Virginia and recruited a lot of players. There were a lot of good basketball players in West Virginia that did not go to West Virginia University. There just wasn't enough room on the roster for all these players. Howard Hurt was an all-ACC player at Duke. Johnny Fry from Huntington was an all-ACC player at Duke. There were players at Richmond. There were players at um, other schools that, that couldn't get on the roster at West Virginia. And I remember Eddie Barrett, who was the publicist here for all those years, he said that, that Chuck No would come in West Virginia and he would look at the box scores and he would see the scores in the 80s and the 90s. And he would look at the box scores of the games in Virginia and they were in the 40s and 50s. He said, I want those guys. Those are the guys I want on my team. And that's the style that West Virginia played. Fred Schaus was a showman. Uh, he liked the things that Rod Hunley did. Uh, he he wanted, one of the things that Fred Schaus wanted to do, uh, he, he actually made his guys shave their arm hair, shave their armpits and their legs. 
he thought that would make them appealing to women because he wanted because he wanted to grow the program and get fans to the games. And I remember Hunley telling me that that was one of the things that Fred Schaus did was he made them shave their arms and, and so forth because he thought that would make them look more appealing to women. They used the high knee socks that um, that, that North Carolina uh, had popularized. And they played, they had a special basketball that they warmed up with. They had a carpet. He, there was a carpet, there was a guy in, um, it was a Wonder Weave carpet. And I can't remember where they, I think it was in North Carolina. He came to Fred and said, hey, would you like to do this? And Fred said, yeah, that would be great. And they put this carpet, they introduced the carpet. So the team would, would run out on a carpet. They had the special ball and it was an event. I mean, when people, I mean, listen, First of all, you couldn't get to Morgantown in the 50s. It was very difficult. It took all day to get there. You know, uh, and kids were car sick when they would pull up to the arena. But it was like the pros. It was like the big time when they got to go into the field house and see Hunley and see West and see Thorne. That was a big deal. And I think Fred Schaus was a, was a, a person that really understood and uh fostered that i think and and a lot of that came into play in the 50s and west virginia had a great reputation and i think mm -hmm. one other thing i just wrote about it today another important piece to the the to the uh, uh marketability and the brand of mountaineer basketball was wwva when wwva came on board in the early 50s it was a 50,000 watt station okay very similar to KMOX and the way KMOX broadcast the St. Louis Cardinals. And you had legions of Cardinal fans all over the country because they could get KMOX at night. It was the same thing with Mountaineer basketball. Not so much football because the signal, you know, in the daytime didn't reach as far as it did at night. But at night, when WWVA broadcast Mountaineer basketball games, you could hear it everywhere. And they were good. They had good, exciting teams. And when you go from Hunley to West to Thorne, there were a lot of fans in New York and along the Eastern uh, Seaboard, uh, D.C., whatnot, that listened to Mountaineer games. Well, in 1962, no, no, I'm sorry, 1963, WWVA dropped uh, uh, the, the network uh, uh, for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. And that left a big hole in the coverage for Mountaineer basketball. Well, there was a fan in Richmond, Virginia named Lowell Schwab, who was from Kingwood. He was um, a doctor in Richmond. He couldn't get the games. So he took time off, came up to West Virginia and, and asked him what he could do to, to, to try to get the games so he could list them. Obviously, there was no satellite radio back then. There was no streaming apps. There was no, if you didn't get the games on terrestrial radio, you didn't get the games. And they weren't on television. And I can remember Mike Patrick telling me a story about television. When television came aboard, the officiating immediately improved because everybody saw how bad it was in road games. Before, you'd go, you, you know, and when during the days of the radio, um, you could go to a game and, and, and West Virginia might be playing uh, George Washington at Uline Arena and Jerry West might have three fouls in the first five minutes because, uh, you know, nobody saw the games unless you were there. But at any rate, so Lowell Schwab goes and he, he realizes that there's nothing can be done about WWBA. They're not going to carry the games. So he goes to Richmond and he, he goes to WRVA in Richmond, another 50,000 watt station, goes to them and convinces the station manager if he can find a sponsor, WRVA will put the games on. Um, they had tried to put on William and Mary and Virginia Tech games, couldn't do it, couldn't find a sponsorship. So Lowell Schwab went out on his own and found Old Dominion Candy Company in Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, to sponsor West Virginia basketball games on WRVA, 275 miles away from Morgantown. They carried the games. He went out and raised money. He had a, what was called a West Virginia basketball radio fund. They raised $2,500 all in one, five, and $10 donations to come up with the money to pay for the phone lines. They had the games on. That's how popular Mountaineer basketball was in the early 1960s. One fan took it upon himself to get the games on a radio station that was not even remotely near a market in West Virginia. That's a great story.
It opens the whole world. I mean, I can remember Rod Hundley telling me when he was a kid, you know, he bounced around from home to home because he was basically an orphan. And he can, he would tell me that in one of the homes that he lived in, in Charleston, he lived underneath the steps and they put up a little curtain and had a bed and he had a transistor radio and he would listen to the basketball games. He listened to Jack Fleming and he'd get a little piece of paper and he would line it out and keep score of the games and keep the stats of, of uh, Leland Bird and Hard Times Green and, 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 and all of those guys from those teams in, in, in the 1940s. And that's how he developed a love for basketball. And that's Jerry West was another one. He, when he was a kid, he used to listen to the Mountaineer games in bed with a radio down so his parents couldn't hear him. And he would listen to the games at night. And uh, that's how these guys grew up. And, you know, I think the key – I think the key moment in the history of West Virginia basketball, without question, was 1942. Prior to 1942, they didn't give scholarships. Your players were made up of football and baseball players that, that did get scholarships, particularly football. 1942, Dyke Racy takes the team. Well, let me back up. Uh, the the uh, It was two years prior when they eliminated the center jump, okay, after each basket, that completely changed basketball. You know, guys like George Mikan and a lot of the teams in the Big Ten dominated basketball with big players. It was a slow game. It was a boring game. Uh, every time there was, a, uh, there was a basket, there was a stoppage of play to do a jump ball. When that changed, basketball changed. And Dyke Racy was ahead of the curve. Dyke Racy uh, was, a, was a coach who wanted movement, he wanted passing, he wanted motion, he wanted fast players, he wanted guys who uh, could handle the ball and shoot it, and, and he developed those types of teams at West Virginia. And in 1942, they had a team that was good enough to get to qualify for the NIT. Back then, only conference champions went to the NCAA tournament. The NCAA, really, in my opinion, I think West Virginia could legitimately claim a national championship in 1942 because the NIT was every bit as good as the NCAA tournament. Kentucky went to that tournament every year. Um, it, the NCAA tournament really didn't become what it was until after the gambling scandal that took place in the late 40s, early 50s with with um, with uh, CCNY and Kentucky and all of that. And then, and then the NCAA kind of took it over and uh, and became the prominent tournament. But back in the 40s, the NIT was every bit as good as the um, as the NCAA tournament. Well, West Virginia obviously goes through that tournament, upsets Claire B., who was from Grafton, West Virginia, coached at uh, LIU. Um, they uh, beat Western Kentucky and then he beat, I think it was Toledo. I, I don't remember exactly the order of the games, but won the championship game. And from that moment on, there was a small network of radio stations that covered the games. Everybody heard the games in West Virginia. The following year, West Virginia gets its first basketball scholarship. Uh, Jimmy Walthaw's cousin, um, Joe Walthaw, uh, who was from Greenbrier Military Academy, they began giving scholarships. Um, they expanded their roster. And kids in West Virginia really began to start playing basketball. And that's really in my opinion, when the, the development and growth of basketball in the state really happened. And I know Jerry West told me this once, that when they used to play an all-star game, they used to play the West Virginia, Kentucky all-star games. In the years that he played, they beat Kentucky. West Virginia may not have had as many players that they had as Indiana or Kentucky or, or different states, but every bit is good. The players that were developed here uh, during that period, every bit as good as those states, just not as many. That NIT was very important. And my understanding is it was really through a political connection that that West Virginia, I, is it correct? I think they were the, it was only an eight-team uh, field. They were the eight seed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they were the last team selected. Well, I think. What happened was, is it, they beat uh, they won on the they won on the road. It was Army. They won an Army fifty seven to forty. And then at the end of the year, uh, Legs Holly did a little bit of uh, horse trading. They which which they used to say that Legs Holly had a briefcase and he would go around and the only thing in his briefcase was a bottle of whiskey, and that was uh, 
<laughs> that was that was how he did his negotiating with the bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and um, and but they got into the tournament. They were the A seat. Now I'll tell you something else is kind of a part of this. West Virginia became uh, a, a favorite team in New York City, and I think one of the reasons why was because of the gamblers. Because if you remember, you know, uh, West Virginia was the eighth seed, and people that put money on the Mountaineers uh, won a lot of money in that tournament. And um, for for years, when they were invited, they were always a fan favorite when they went to New York because Mountaineers. Because as you know, the NIT the, there was a lot of gambling that went on in that tournament back in the '40s. That was one of the one of one of the one of the hidden parts of of that tournament. And uh, West Virginia made them a lot of money. And, you know, you mentioned about Fred Schaus and you remember, mentioned about uh, 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 the legs Holly. Red Brown also, too, uh, after uh, after um, uh, after uh, legs, when legs died of a heart attack, Red Brown took a chance on Fred Schaus right. uh, to be the coach. And Fred had never coached before. And one of the reasons why he did it was because he wanted a young coach that had a professional background and a pedigree uh, with a tie to West Virginia, number one, that he could get for, for a cheap amount of money, which he did, but also to somebody who could be a mentor to Hundley because Hundley was a handful. And, you know, when Fred got the job, uh, not within mo- uh, weeks after he got the job, Hundley left campus and went, went to Philadelphia to be on that um, touring team that was similar to the Globetrotters, the Spas. And he was going to turn pro and go and tour and and tore out his knee and came back to campus. So that's what Fred had to deal with right away with Hunley. And Fred wasn't much older than Hop. You know, it was there was very there was a close a similarity there to age. And um, he was able to um, steer through that and and keep Rod on course and get him through his career here to get to Jerry West and get to those teams that were that were much better than when Hunley was here. But but with with Red, one of the interesting things, and, and Bucky Waters pointed this out to me, when Bucky Waters was an assistant coach at Duke, he had offers to go and coach at LSU, West Virginia, and there were a couple of other places that, that were considering him. And the reason that he picked West Virginia over LSU was because West Virginia was one of the few schools in the country at the time that had an athletic director with a basketball background. And they didn't have that at LSU. He knew he was going to be the redheaded stepchild to LSU football there. And if you remember, LSU ended up hiring Press Maravich, and he brought his son, Pete. Bucky tried to recruit Pete Maravich here. And, and you know, Pete didn't have high scores, test scores, so he couldn't get in to the schools at, in the North Carolina schools. He could get into West Virginia, but, of course, there was no way that, 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 that Press was not going to, you know, go wherever he was going to go and not take his son with him because, yeah. because uh, Pete Maravich was obviously part of that, part of that deal. But that's what West Virginia basketball was. And Bobby Bowden told me this. He said, you know, when we got there in football, um, we knew that West Virginia uh, was considered like North Carolina and Kentucky with basketball. And Jim Carlin went out and changed that. And that was kind of at the time when the uh, the change came from West Virginia being a basketball school to more of a football school, particularly in terms of interest and funding and, and all of that. And that's when it changed. You know, from my perspective, that you know, going to today, that's one of the reasons I think Steve Kerr is such a terrific pro coach because he has such a rich back background as a, a lot of people don't know. He's a, he was a GM too for a while mm-hmm. uh, with Phoenix, as well as obviously being a pro player with Michael Jordan and the Bulls and talk about difficult personalities. A lot of people would say coaching the, in the NBA is as much about managing the player oh. as it is about yeah. X's and O's. In fact, for me, <laughs> may not even be a comparison. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's getting like that in college basketball, too. Yeah, that's I think, right. Uh, I think so, particularly now with NIL and what's going on. You know, uh, you, you would talk to coaches for years, and they always said that the, you had to be kind of dictatorial in nature, manage your program with an iron fist and kind of and, and kind of manage all aspects. I'm not sure you can do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Catlett uh, coached that style, Bob Huggins to a degree, Fred Schaus, 
all these successful coaches managed every aspect of the program and demanded a lot from their players and their players obviously um, uh, produced, but you know, uh, that's kind of changing now. And I think to your point, I think um, innovators, coaches that can manage players, coaches that can uh, keep their rosters intact, coaches that maybe do things a little bit different than everybody else. I think those are the ones that are the most successful. And if you look at college basketball today, there are no dominant teams because the rosters turn over so much. Um, there's so the players jump around. Um, and that starts in high school and AAU. I mean, these guys are going from AAU team to AAU team to high school. Um, that's, that's just a part of the nature of the sport now. So it, it's, it's almost impossible to be able to take a team get a, a group of freshmen and then run them through your, uh, your program for four years and keep those guys intact. It's that, that's just not part of the game now. So the coaches that can, that can figure things out, that can develop them as quickly as possible, get them to play a style that, um, that they can play together. And, and, and I think those are the ones that are, are the most successful. And, you know, um, that's, that's the, what's the approach that probably West Virginia is going to have to take moving forward is finding guys finding finding that uh, some way to develop their niche to be able to to do what to, what they can do yeah and the, related to that again is the important role of the athletic director mm -hmm. to be able to understand uh and embrace what you just said john and then go pick well i'll tell you and you make a great point because ren ren baker has a extensive background in basketball he knows this game. You know, he 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 grew up uh, working for Eddie Sutton. Um, you know, he coached basketball. He understands the game, and um, he has a keen awareness. He was on the NIT selection committee, so he studies the game. He understands analytics. He knows all the all all the different aspects to the game. So, um, it, West Virginia is in great hands in, in that regard. Um, having an AD who understands the game, and yeah. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that that's great because, again, uh, for the fans, one of the reasons we do this with guests like uh, you is to help help fans understand some of the, you know, the nooks and crannies, so to speak, of understanding success. And one of the things we both know is that it's uh, you could you if you if you follow the recipe, so to speak, formally you outline you can win in basketball and it doesn't take 10 years. I mean, you look at these teams that come out, you may not be able to sustain it, but you'll be able to to win and, and make national noise. And that's one one of the things that are very exciting. I mean, I think years back, you talked about uh, West Virginia being one player away. Well, St. Bonaventure, uh, they were one player away when Bob Lanier went Bob down. St. Bonaventure would have won the national championship 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, oh, you're absolutely correct. Well, it doesn't take many. It doesn't take many players in basketball to, to get things right. So that's the good news. You just have to find the right guys. And, you know, for years, West Virginia had, had relied on local players, state players. Their best teams up until, you know, the, the modern era came from from West Virginia guys. Um, I can remember a funny story. Levi Phillips. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. He played at, played at Charleston. And this was in the um, this was around the time when West Virginia was beginning to transition from 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 having a lot of in-state in players that were good enough to play at West Virginia to the point where there were there were much uh, fewer uh, the pickings was much more slim. I know uh, Bucky Waters would told me he said yeah, he would get calls from people that would say hey get down here. You need to go down to war. The next Jerry West is down at war or he's over at Burnsville or whatever. And Bucky would go to these places and he'd say, there are no more Jerry West. The wells run dry. They just aren't there. Well, Levi was a good player at Charleston and George King, who was French house assistant at WVU went to Purdue, recruited Rick Mount, went to the national championship game and actually hired Fred when he was the AD at Purdue, George King is coaching at Purdue. He's recruiting Levi Phillips in Charleston. George King was from Charleston. One of the great players in the state, probably after Jerry West, you could argue his career in pro basketball. He won an, an NBA championship with Syracuse. You could argue was 
was equally as good as Hundley's. Maybe some people think he might have been the second best player to play basketball in West Virginia in, in the pros. George King had a great career at Purdue. So he's coaching at Purdue. He's recruiting Levi Phillips. West Virginia staff at the time, Sonny Moran, Gary McPherson are concerned. They go down. They have a home visit with Levi's mom. They're sitting in the uh, either in the kitchen or the, in the living room with Mrs. Phillips. Levi gets up, excuses himself. I think he's whatever. He goes, leaves the room. And Levi's mom looks at the coaches, McPherson and, and Moran. He's got she's got this worried look on her face. She says, Coach, I love George King. He's such a wonderful man. He said, He, I know he'll take care of my son, but I just can't see myself letting my son leave the country to play at Peru. And Sonny looks at her and says, Peru. And Gary stops him, puts his hand on his knee, and looks over at Levi's mom and says, Mrs. Phillips. You know, Peru is an awful long way from Charleston. <laughs> so West Virginia <laughs> ends up getting Levi Phillips because Levi's mom thinks he's going to leave the country uh, to play at Peru. But um, <laughs> you know, that, and, and, and that was that was at a time when when every good prospect in the state um, uh, was was valued. I mean, they had uh, Warren Baker uh, was from Greenbrier. He was a great player from the state. Maurice Robinson was a big name player. And, and a lot of these guys, the link to getting them to come to West Virginia was Fritz Williams. You know, Fritz Williams was the first black player. He was for Weirton, probably more the most recruited player in the history of the state. Um, mm -hmm. When Fritz Williams came to West Virginia, it was a big, big deal. And um, obviously, Fritz had a good career here. Uh, people thought it could have been better, you know, um, had uh, George King coached him instead of Bucky Waters. But he had a good NBA career. And a lot of the black players after uh, Fritz Williams, including uh, Will Robinson, on up through, Fritz was the key to recruiting them. And, you know, I mentioned Will Robinson. I'll tell you a funny story about Will Robinson real quick here. I know we can go on and on and on, and, and we, we don't have a, a unlimited time here. But um, Will Robinson was a great player. A terrific player and and you know challenged and actually broke Jerry West season scoring record the one year that when they had the car wreck I mean he was the only player they had left and um that great tragedy when they lost most of their roster he was scoring all the points well one year Will was and they always used to say about Will that uh he couldn't go to his left and as uh Gary McPherson told me he said we well, didn't need to nobody could stop him going to his right <laughs> So they're they're playing a game. Uh, they're they're playing a game down in in, uh, in playing George Washington, which was a big rival. And if you ever get Bob Huggins on your show, bring up the name Pat Talent because Pat Talent used to wear him out. Huggins could not guard Pat Talent from GW. West Virginia GW had a pretty good rivalry um, during the years during the Southern Conference, and then in the years when they were independents. So they're playing a game over in Virginia. Uh, George Washington didn't have, they used to play in Uline Arena, but they they were playing across the river in Virginia, and they're playing a game, and it's a close back and forth game. And if you remember back then, they didn't have a three-point shot, they didn't have a shot clock, so you could you could do four corners, you could hold the ball or whatnot, and, and, and slow the game down or whatnot. So they're, so they're in a close game, and there's about a minute left, and Sonny Moran calls timeout. He brings the team over, and he goes through and he says, this is what I want you guys to do. He draws up the strategy. He says, I want the ball in Will Robinson's hand. And I want Will to shoot the ball with not a lot of time left on the clock because George Washington had a timeout. They could call timeout, whatnot. And, and, and if they got the ball and got the rebound and go down and score and get the winning points. So Will's like, okay, coach, got it. So they go back out on the floor. And obviously the ball gets around to Will. And Will's dribbling out the clock with his back to the scoreboard. Uh, trying to dribble it down before he's going to make a move and shoot a shot. And so all of a sudden, the students in the crowd start counting down. Five, four, three, two. So Will turns around and shoots this wild shot, misses and gets off the backboard. George Washington grabs a rebound, calls timeout. There's still 10 seconds left on the clock. So they come over to the, come over to the side, and Sonny goes, Will, what are you doing? I told you, don't shoot the ball until there's no time left on the clock. He said, well, the students were counting down, and they were counting down, and I heard them. He said, I thought they were telling the truth. 
And his teammate, Dick Simons, who's from Toronto, Ohio, looks at him and says, Will, what the hell are you doing? This is Washington, D.C. Nobody tells the truth here. <laughs> <laughs> so they had, uh, West Virginia ended up winning win the game in overtime. And, uh, but yeah. uh, that was, that was kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. John, this has been uh, great. I knew it would be. I learned so much, and I think this will be great for the fans who will watch it, too. Uh, you know, there's so much to be proud of. I keep on telling people this, even though I don't need to tell them. There, there's so much to be proud in terms of WVU athletics. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's it's not just a source of pride. It's really informative educationally. And uh, I think we all hold the same, I know we do, hold the same hope that uh, – it's going to come around again, where the where WVU is a is a is a major force, and what it happens will. nationally. It will. And I agree. We, it yeah. will because we've got great fans. We've got people that care. As long as you have people that care, you've got good people. Um, it, it, it will come back, and um, I'm I'm confident that it will. I know that there's a it's a challenging climate right now. I know things are changing daily, um, but as long as the people care. Uh, West Virginia basketball, West Virginia football, West Virginia sports will always be strong. Yeah, and I think what you've done is not only put your finger on it, but uh, you're absolutely correct. That's not even debatable. People do care. The fan base is there. It's passionate, uh, and it's historic. Well, look at look at look at this year. I mean, real quickly, look at this year. Look at the attendance figures this year. This has not been a very good year. Um, obviously. Uh, Josh was dealt a very difficult situation, um, and fans are still come out. I mean, they're averaging over over ten thousand a game for for home games uh, for for um, for this season. So that shows you that demonstrates uh, the strong fan base that we have and the interest that people have um, in, in Mountaineer sports. And, and again, as long as people care, uh, this 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 program will, will be okay. Yep, yep, and people do care. And I think for all of us, we just need to be patient. But mm -hmm. the nature of basketball is not the same as football. And so not only can Humpty Dumpty be put up back up on the wall, but the turnaround can be faster than not as fast. And, you know, one of the things I keep on telling people, you know, all eyes are on St. John's now with uh, with Rick Pitino. But, you know, I said, you know, the team in the Big East that I, I keep on looking at, I mean, you look at what Coach Wright did at Villanova uh, mm -hmm. to win two national championships uh, and the way he did it is just that to me is a storyline. No, no lottery players. He had no lottery players. He developed guys. Now uh, it, he it, it 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 would be more challenging to keep those teams intact. But but you're right. And he played a unique style. Um, had players that fit what he wanted to do. He got them to play um, the way he wanted them to play. They played for each other. And you're right. It was it's fun basketball to watch. And that's that's enjoyable. The women's team out here with what Mark Kellogg's doing, they're a fun yeah. team. I don't know if you ever get a chance to watch them play. Uh, yeah. Once he gets enough players in his system uh, uh, to be able to play the way he wants to play, it's a fun style of basketball to watch. Yeah, it, do it doesn't take long even for the fan, no. uh, like myself, uh, to look at that and say, uh, this guy's, uh, you know, top shelf and uh, yeah. this is a good team, and he's got some good players. But again, it takes time too. Well, yeah, and you know his style is in our DNA. If you go back and you look at the history of uh, running up and down, playing an up and down style, scoring points, getting out, that's the style of play that West Virginia fans have known and loved for years, going back to West and and Hunley and Hard Times Green and Scotty Hamilton, all the way back through through time. And that's the style that people here really embrace and enjoy. And that's the style he plays on the women's side. Yeah. Well, John, thanks so much for taking the time. I know that uh, your time, you're so busy, especially, uh, I shouldn't say especially this time of year, but mm -hmm. you've got the tournaments coming up yeah. and so many things happening at once and always an honor. And I just want to thank you so much. I appreciate